I am here to introduce Lawrence Lessig. He came to speak at our convention in Louisville, Kentucky, the Coffee Party Convention, and I would say he rocked it. There were a lot of people who walked out saying, that changed my life. And I personally feel like um, what Larry has to say is tremendously inspiring for me and hopefully have been channeling some of my excitement to the coffee party and sort of the larger movement about where things could go and what's really at stake here. And, and to me, what's really at stake here is um, about our trust in our government. Can we trust our government right now, given the level that we're being marginalized by um, corporations and people with tremendous amount of money? So um, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Larry, the rock star of the movement so far. <laughs> So let me say that if the movement has for its rock star a law professor, we're in real trouble. Uh, <laughs> so I want to start by thinking a little bit about money in the wrong places. Right? I don't mean money. I mean money in the wrong places. So for example, one of the most amazing things about the many amazing things about the growth of a fetus is the timing of various stages in the fetus's development. In one particular bit of this timing is that at a moment in the development of the fetus, or a period of time in the development of the fetus, the fetus is very vulnerable to estrogen. Estrogen can be extremely damaging to the development at these moments. And the body, the woman's body obviously, creates a barrier during those times that protects the fetus from the effects of estrogen. Now in the mid-1990s, this man, Professor Frederick von Saal, began to pursue a question. The question was, did the body respond in the same way to man-made estrogen? Did it likewise block man-made estrogen or estrogenic compounds from the fetus? And the answer he discovered uh, was no man-made estrogenic compounds seeped into the space where the fetus was developing. And this produced in him a significant amount of concern. And so he launched a project to test on mice. I know, poor mice, but that's the way it is. We test on mice um, to see whether the effect of this leakage would be damaging to the fetus. And the answer to those inquiries was a four-letter word, V bad, very, very bad. The effect, as he described it, was large, and in fact, it reflects current disease trends in the human population. If you imagine the human population having the same kind of effects that we saw in the mice, then you would see consequences like reduced sperm counts to spontaneous miscarriages, prostate and breast cancers, degenerative brain diseases, attention deficit disorders to obesity and insulin resistance, which links it to type 2 diabetes. Man-made estrogenic compounds in particular. This chemical, I'm not even going to say what it is because we know its word is BPA. BPA. Now BPA, it turns out, has a posse out there, an industry. Interesting to defend its continued use in basically every single bit of plastic or surfaces that we are exposed to in our life. Harper's, in December of 2009, produced a memo from a meeting that the BPA Joint Trade Association had in May of 2009, trying to address the problem of how they were going to respond to the increasing fury about BPA in our environment. They said they needed to, quote, develop potential communication and media strategies around EPA, a balance of legislative and grassroots outreach to young mothers and students is imperative to the stability of the industry. The strategies they would use include using fear tactics. Do you want to have access to your baby food anymore? And the media, they noticed, was starting to ignore their side. The committee doubted they could obtain a scientific spokesman to push their cause. So what was their holy grail for a spokesperson here? They said spokesman, but let's say spokesperson, because who is their holy grail? A pregnant 
young mother who would be willing to speak around the country about the benefits of BPA. Okay, so, some say this chemical is extremely dangerous. Some say it's safe. And in fact, if you look at the research, it's divided. There's research on both sides. But when you divide the research in a very particular way, distinguishing out industry-funded research from independently funded research, the numbers are quite startling. Industry-funded research, 100% of it concludes there is no harm caused by BPA. In the independently funded research, however, 14% finds no harm, and 86% of the independently funded research finds harm flowing from the exposure to BPA. Or here's another example. You've all seen devices like this, cell phones. Sometimes you might ask yourself, are these safe, right? 70% of you think yes, or maybe not this group, but 70% of the ordinary public out there think it's yes, because most of us think, as I certainly would have thought, how is it possible that they're not safe? Right? We've had more than 40 years of usage of these devices. It can't possibly be that after 40 years, we haven't done enough to know whether exposure to this kind of microwave radiation so close to our brains is safe. Well, a paper published in GQ, um, actually it was delayed for a year in its publication because of the threats made by the cell phone industry against GQ if they publish this paper. Um, produced an enormous amount of information about how, in fact, there's real question about the safety of cell phones. And once again here, turns out the research is divided. Some show that there's real danger of certain cancers being produced by this exposure, and others show that there's no such danger. But this man, Dr. Henry Lai of the University of Washington, decided he would do a similar analysis of that research. He divided the research between industry-funded research and independently-funded research. And what he found was industry-funded research, 28% of it found some biologic effect from exposure to this microwave radiation. 72% found no such effect. Independently-funded research, 33% found no effect. And 67% found some effect. Once again, reversing the conclusions produced solely because of the source of the funding. Now, in these two examples, I think I've done something to your brain, <laughs> changing the confidence you've had because I've shown you something about money in the wrong place, in the ecology of producing the information that we have about whether these products are safe. I've made you more skeptical. Some were sure, some will remain sure about their conclusions about the harmlessness of BPA or the harmlessness of phones. I frankly am not sure myself. But what I am sure of is I'm much less sure of my kind of middle class views that it's got to be safe. How else could the world be that it wouldn't be safe? I'm much less sure because I know the money is in the wrong place in these studies. We decided to test this as a general phenomenon to see whether this is how people react generally when money is brought into the story. So we ran a test at the psych uh, lab at Harvard where we tried to measure trust and confidence of people as a function of whether money was in the wrong place. And what we found is placing money in the wrong place constantly across these areas weakens people's confidence about an institution or an entity of public trust and increases mistrust. And again, not the presence of money. Nobody's opposed to, for example, doctors being paid. But money having a relationship to the underlying judgment that is improper. Okay, totally different story. From the Wall Street Journal a month ago. The article in the Wall Street Journal puzzled about the explosion of these extenders in our tax code. Provisions that need to be reenacted every single time a budget is enacted that grant to certain entities or companies certain tax benefits. And for most of the history of our tax system, there were no such things. But beginning in the 1980s, we started to have these temporary tax benefits. And now there is an explosion of them. And the question the journal tried to figure out is why? Well, the first of these comes from the Ronald Reagan tax cuts. In 1981, there was a research and development tax cut 
which when it was being proposed, many Democrats and some businesses said they didn't believe it was actually going to increase investment. So the deal, the compromise was, they would make that tax cut temporary, and then they would test it. They would have economists look at the results, and they would decide whether this tax cut actually worked. Did it work? It did. Across the board, left and right economists will agree this research and development tax cut was a great tax credit idea. It actually has exactly the kind of effect we want tax cuts to have. It spurs investments, and so it made sense that we have this in our tax code. It made sense absolutely if there's anything in our code that makes sense, this is one that makes sense. But the puzzle here is the tax credit is still temporary. 1999, there was a group of congressmen that tried to make it permanent. That failed. They couldn't make it permanent, even though every single member of the committee voting on it actually supported the tax credit, thought it was the greatest idea since tax sliced bread. And just yesterday, the Institute for Policy Innovation wrote about how Congress has now once again just belatedly extended this R&D tax credit and once again questioned why it was. This was perpetually temporary. What explains it? Well, as they explain at the bottom of their little memo here, when it gets extended, it's always preceded by a, quote, series of fundraisers and speeches <laughs> about the importance of nurturing innovation. Congress essentially uses this cycle to raise money for re-election, promising industry more predictability the next time around. Rebecca Kaisar, professor of law, wrote about this in this piece in the Georgia Law Review in 2006. She talks about this tax cut in particular. She said, the principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. And she says, these businesses are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure continuations of this large tax savings. So understand the dynamic that's going on here, because it's a dynamic that describes exactly how Washington works. We have the architects of tax policy deciding where and how we should tax, taxing in a way designed at least in part for them to raise money to run for Congress. Not based on what makes sense or even what makes sense for the right versus what makes sense for the left. This is not a right-left issue. This is solely about how do you facilitate shakedowns of those who you are taxing so that they will give you the money that you need and then you in return give them the tax credits they are buying. And it's not just taxes. Al Gore, when he was vice president, was running a program that had as a project the objective of deregulating a certain area of the telecommunications industry. His senior staffer took this idea to the Hill. The response they got from the Hill was, hell no. If we deregulate these guys, how are we going to raise money from them? <laughs> so the point is we tax in order to raise money to run for Congress, not for our treasury, and we regulate in order to raise money to run for Congress, not to find the right balance between free markets unregulated and regulated markets guided by government policies. And the question here is, what is this influence here doing to our democracy? What is the influence of money in the wrong place here doing to our democracy? Now, the American people have a very clear view about the answer to that question. Just last week, we commissioned a study from this group, the Global Strategy Group, that did a national survey. And the national survey concluded that 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. 75%. Among Democrats, it's a little higher right now, 81%. Republicans, it's 71%. But I can tell you, because I've seen similar surveys before the Republicans took over, that when the Democrats controlled Congress, the numbers were reversed. <laughs> But even if they're slightly more for the party out of power, they are always consistently extremely high. If we as Americans agree about any one thing, we agree about this. We agree that money buys results in Congress. Now, we believe this because we see all sorts of craziness in what government does that can be explained only by the money and the most prominent the most disgusting example of that is the 
extraordinary story that we are just as a nation coming to understand fully around the Wall Street debacle that took our economy over the cliff and produced the Great Recession. Now, there are a lot of theories about what caused this. Um, of course, Rick Santelli launched the Tea Party by saying it was the losers who caused our problem as he ranted against the losers who Barack Obama was trying to help by giving some mortgage relief. But I think any sane view about what caused this collapse was an extraordinary pattern of gambling by Wall Street banks. And why did Wall Street banks gamble the way they did? There are two reasons. Number one, tied to deregulation, and number two, tied to a particular kind of re-regulation. So first, deregulation, a project that began under Bill Clinton's first uh, term when Bill Clinton decided he needed to convince Wall Street that the Democrats could love banks as much as the Republicans do, a project that led in 1999 to the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, which meant that banks could now be gamblers. They were permitted to engage in risky investments just like an investment bank could and still be considered a bank. And then in 2004, the FCC removed all limits on the leverage that these investment bank banks would be um, playing with, meaning they could gamble with other people's money. They borrowed the money they were gambling with and they leveraged it sometimes 33 to 1. Now that sounds like a, if you're not financial, that sounds like a weird number, but here's what it means. 1% drop can practically wipe out all of the assets of the bank. 1% drop in the value of the assets when it's leveraged 33 to 1. And so what did these banks do when these two changes were made? One, that they were permitted to gamble, and number two, they were permitted to borrow all the money in the world to gamble. They gambled. Right? Now, many people look at them and they say, these guys were just idiots. They were not idiots. What they did made perfect sense for them, given a second change, which our government brought about over the last 20 years. A certain kind of re-regulation. The re-regulation was an effective guarantee that our government gave these banks that when the bubble that they produced blew up, they would get a bailout. So that it was a heads they win, tails we lose gamble. They gambled, they won, they gambled, they lost, we paid them off. They got that bailout. These banks that became too big to fail were determined reasonably from any public policy perspective as too big to fail, meaning we won't let them fail. And that meant there was a guarantee that made the gambling made sense and that encouraged more gambling, producing what many have referred to as the kind of dumbest form of socialism ever produced by man. We socialize the risk, but we privatize the benefit. All of us bear the risk but only a certain small number of extraordinarily wealthy banks get the benefit. Now, this criticism is not just raving from some lefty. Um, I'm left-handed, I, I don't mean I'm uh, left, necessarily from left, but any deregulation as the cause. Here's Richard Posner, conservative judge in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Am I saying that deregulation made banks take risks that were excessive from an overall social standpoint? Yes. Absolutely, no ambiguity in this conservative jurist's view about what series of stupid government decisions to deregulate the banks led them to the point of behaving as crazily as they do. And about this issue of too big to fail, I mean, what we know is that these banks have just gotten bigger. The guarantee that they have because they've gotten bigger is that they get loans from the private market cheaper than small banks do. Why do they get loans cheaper? Because the market figures that these banks can never fail. So their risk is lower than the risk of a small bank. So that because we've allowed them to get as big as they've gotten, they get an effective subsidy from this lower interest rate. So Hart and Zingales, two right-wing libertarian economists, said the spread had grown to 0.49%, meaning that's the lower interest rate that they effectively got. For the 18 American banks with more than $100 billion in assets, this advantage corresponds to a $34 billion subsidy per year. 
Now, as these libertarian economists say, ending this system of too big to fail is crucial. Zingales, writing in the Cato uh, magazine, said, if you have a sector where losses are socialized, but where gains are privatized, then you destroy the economic and moral supremacy of capitalism. Assuming people think there is an economic and moral supremacy of capitalism. <laughs> if they do, you destroy it, so long as this is the system you allow. So the one thing we should have done in the banking reform process that we've just gone through, the one thing that should have been accomplished through this law was a reform to end this too big to fail reality. Did that reform do that? Did it end the too big to fail? No, as you all know, it didn't. And why didn't it? Why would it not do that when it's the most obvious thing to do? Well, contributions from people who supported keeping the banks the size that they were were $30 million compared to $10 million to those who wanted reform. Lobbying was $105 million versus $5 million of those who wanted reform. On October 2009, there were 25 times the number of lobbyists on Capitol Hill fighting to oppose reform, more than 1,500 lobbyists, as there were lobbyists on Capitol Hill supporting fundamental bank reform. So we have bad policy here, a product of money in the wrong places. America has lost faith in this government. 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress. That number means 11%. Right? I've said this a million times before. There were more people who, who supported the British crown at the time of the revolution <laughs> than who have confidence in our Congress today. When does an institution go bankrupt from a moral public perspective if it's not at 11%? That is the state of our democracy. And one year ago, this institution, the Supreme Court, in its decision in Citizens United, made that much worse. In its decision that the First Amendment means that corporations have an unlimited right to speak independently, it exacerbated the current economy of influence that leads people to believe that money buys results in Washington. The prediction was there would be an explosion in spending by independent expenditures. And when compared to the last off-year election, indeed, there has been such an explosion. At least 330% increase over the last off-year election. At least that's what we know because, of course, despite the Supreme Court's assumption that all of this would be disclosed, in fact, all of this is not necessarily disclosed. And we have no real way to know who or how much has been spent. Now, the most striking thing about this opinion, I think, is trying to understand why Justice Kennedy, the author of the opinion, thought that this wouldn't be a problem. Critical passage in the opinion, he says, the appearance of influence will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. <laughs> now, you know, here's a lawyer telling you about cause and effect in how people will have faith in their democracy. And so you want to know, well, why would you think that, Justice Kennedy? And he said, well, it's illogical to lose faith in your democracy because of this spending. And the reason it's illogical is the nature of this influence. And what's the illogical reason here? He said, well, all that this money is trying to do, the money that these corporations would be spending, is to persuade voters to vote one way versus another. And so the voters should realize that, hey, after all, we have all the power. It's not the money guys, it's us. Because they're just trying to get us to vote the way they want us to vote. So we have the power. Fear not, endless corporate money is only going to help this democracy. Now, when I read that phrase, I looked at that. I was more focused on the verb tense here. The appearance of influence will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. Justice Kennedy, it already has caused the American people to lose faith 
in their democracy. And there's nothing illogical about the American people losing faith in their democracy in the face of this overwhelming evidence of the way money plays in this system. Because even if the money is just used to persuade us to vote one way or another, the critical point that Kennedy just overlooks is the way in which Congress bends to secure the money that gets contributed or spent. It's the way in which Congress is filled with shape shifters, people who adjust and become different creatures in order to inspire the money they need to get elected or spent on their campaign or against their opponent to get elected. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she came to Congress, she was told by a colleague, always lean to the green. And then to clarify, she said, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> The dynamic is obvious. It's what everybody who actually watches the way this system works knows. Constantly, there's an awareness of how what a congressperson does will affect whether they get money and whether they can raise money, and that constantly forces them to skew their behavior to please the funders. The funders say dance, and they dance, and we produce this marionette congress a system which Professor James Sample describes filled with junkies, members of Congress as junkies dependent upon the funders for their continued survival in Congress. Now, the framers of our Constitution, when they gave us a republic, intended that republic to be a certain kind of representative democracy. As Federalist 52 puts it, a democracy where the democratic branch would be a branch that was dependent upon the people alone. They believed Congress should have a dependency. They weren't against dependency. They were for the right sort of dependency. They wanted a dependency on the people and not on other influences that might muck up their ability to do what the people wanted. So there's elaborate structure in our Constitution to protect Congress from the influence of the president. President, like the king the framers feared, might be able to exercise too much influence over Congress and then corrupt Congress, stopping them in their objective to focus on the people. The Constitution has a clause that forbids gifts from princes and foreign kings or foreign states without Congress explicitly permitting it because they didn't want these other forces influencing Congress, building dependencies inside of Congress that drew Congress away from what Congress should have been focused on. They wanted one dependency, the dependency on the people alone. But that dependency has been displaced in the current Congress that we have today. There's no more dependency on the people as the exclusive dependency our Congress has. Instead, there's a dependency on the funders. And if anybody is unsure about this, let me state it as clearly as I can, the funders are not the people. What the funders want, right, please, is not what the people want. In study after study, when you look at what funders support for policy, when it conflicts with what the people support for policy, policymakers go with the funders and against the people. In one study by Professor Guilens, 10% of the public supporting something can get it passed so long as they are the funders, even if 90% of the public opposing it cannot stop it from getting passed if they are not the funders. This system of funding has corrupted this Congress. It has bent it, it has queered it, it has distorted it from the intended dependency the framers had, a dependency on the people alone. It has corrupted it, not by bribery. It's not secret cash that's being passed around by members between special interests and Congress people. They used to have safes inside of every congressperson's uh, office where bags of cash would be kept because that was the way of the old quid pro quo corruption system. That's not our system. This is the cleanest Congress in the history of Congress. We don't have bribery as our problem. What we have is in plain sight corruption. It's the corruption everybody is open about and talks about openly. It is the corruption which is the system, which is how people believe politics must run. So we are entitled 
Justice Kennedy. It is perfectly logical, Justice Kennedy. You have to be insane not to believe, Justice Kennedy, that this Congress is corrupt in this fundamental sense of corruption that our framers plainly would have recognized. Now, what do we do about this? Well, some say the thing we ought to be doing is to find a way to overturn this decision. And you've heard a lot of talk today about Article 5, the Constitution, which maps ways to amend the Constitution. And one big push is an amendment to the Constitution that would say corporations are not people. So that we make clear in our constitutional text that it's the people who are to have the power and not corporations. Now, I have to confess, I'm not a supporter of the move to get Congress to amend the Constitution. And I want to defend that position more in questions than in this presentation. But I want to start by getting you to remember one important, obvious fact. On January 20th, 2010, the day before Citizens United was decided, our democracy was already broken. It already didn't work. It wasn't Citizens United that broke it. Even before corporations had the right which Citizens United gave them, we had broken this democracy. And if we wage a campaign to go back to the world as it was on January 20th, 2010, we are not going to fix this democracy. We are not going forward. To go forward here is to end the corrupting dependency. And we end that dependency, the dependency on funders, by restoring the dependency on the people. So how do we make it so that corporations don't have the power that we don't want them to have? The counterintuitive fact here is that an amendment alone won't do that. Because an amendment that says they don't have this power just pushes the money back to the executives in the corporation, real people, who will give the money as they did before Citizens United was decided in a way that makes it so they still have all the power. It's not the fact that there's a legal entity that's exercising political influence that's troubling. It's the fact that it's a small slice of the American public that gets to call the shots for democracy as a whole. A small slice, the slice that gives money, the slice the policymakers turn to and obsessively raise money from. That's the problem. And that problem is not solved by an amendment that says corporations are not people. So how do we solve that problem? Well, I've been to the promised land. <laughs> I know what it looks like. This promised land has some grants and some Franklins in it. I want to describe it. I want to call it the first $50 project. So here's a fact you have to accept. We can quibble about it, but I think it's absolutely true. Every voter in the United States produces at least $50 in federal revenue, even if they don't pay income tax. They pay cigarettes tax or they pay um, uh, gas tax or whatever. They at least produce $50 in revenue to our treasury. Right. Assume that fact for a second. Take the first $50 of revenue that every citizen produces and translate it into a democracy voucher, an entitlement to allocate $50 of revenue or resources to any candidate for Congress or any mix of candidates for Congress. And then in addition to that power, permit candidates who want to opt into the system to accept at most $100 in contributions and real money from any person they want. So every citizen gets $50, plus they can give up to $100 on top. And candidates opting into getting this money, and they have to opt in, it can't be mandatory given the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, would take only that money. They would only take these grants and Franklins. $50 a voter right now would produce $6 billion compared to 2008, the total amount raised and spent in congressional elections was $1.8 billion. Total amount raised and spent by parties in 2008 was something just around $3.8 billion. 
So $6 billion is more than the total amount parties and candidates raised and spent in 2008. Now, if a person doesn't allocate their voucher, then we'd have a system, this is a detail, it's really complicated to figure out how it works exactly, but it's something like a system that allocates the money back to their party. So the political party gets it if they don't allocate it, but if they allocate it, a candidate gets it how they allocate it. Now, imagine a world where 80% of Congress people opted into this system. And imagine that Congress doing some stupid thing as they no doubt would because democracies make stupid mistakes all the time. The point is to recognize that even when the Congress did something stupid, no one in that world could rationally believe that they did the stupid thing they did because money was buying the results. The problem that is at the core of the corruption of our government, that the people don't believe it's the people who matter, instead they believe it's the money that matters, would disappear because the funders in this system would be the people. There wouldn't be a dynamic that the funders had separate from what the people were. That would be the same dynamic. And this institution would once again be dependent as intended upon the people alone. Now this functions in ways like the Fair Elections Now Act would have. And I was a big supporter of the Fair Elections Now Act and we came very close to passing it in the House in 2010. But my view is it's better than the Fair Elections Now Act. It's better because first there's more money here. But more importantly, it responds to a very strong criticism that people on the right in particular have about any system to fund elections publicly. The criticism they typically have is that my money is being used to support speech I don't believe in. You know, and I think, well, Mitch McConnell is using my money to support lots of speech I don't believe in either, and I don't get to complain about that. But okay, if you buy that criticism, here's the thing about the first $50 project. No one can say, my money is funding speech I don't like because it's your $50 that you are allocating as you want and only your $50 that gets allocated as you want. Nothing more beyond your money is being used for anything other than what you want. That, in my view, is the promised land. But that promised land is far away from us today. It's a long way to get there. It's at least two years away, maybe more. And so the question is, what should we be doing now? How should we be organizing to get there now? So this event is organized around an anniversary, anniversary of this horrible decision. But today is another important anniversary. Indeed, I think much more important than that horrible decision. January 21st, 2010 is not the day we should be looking at. January 21st, 1911 is the day we should be looking at. 100 years ago today, this man, a Republican, I know it's not believable given the kind of foofy hair, but he really was a Republican, <laughs> Robert La Follette on behalf of a significant number of Republican senators, launched the National Progressive Republican League. And popular government in America, they said, had been thwarted and progressive legislation strangled by the special interests. They focused five principles in that league. Every single one of those five principles was designed to end what they called the corruption of their government. Four of them were about strengthening democratic control in ways that I think some of them were stupid, but you know, like referenda turned out to be a bad idea or electing judges turns out to be, I think, a bad idea. But anyway, their objective was to end corruption. They were progressives. And what we forget today is that the progressives at the turn of the last century were liberals and conservatives both. Liberals and conservatives united in a single view that democracy had been lost. That democracy, not controlled by the special interest, had been lost because of a kind of corruption that would even make Jack Abramoff blush in its grotesqueness and extremity. Right? I'm not saying that our corruption is the same as theirs. It's different and I think worse in some ways, but it's not the bribery corruption that they had but still, that bribery of corruption was what they were fighting against. So this Republican, La Follette, after launching that league, then challenged the sitting president, Taft. And his claim against Taft was that Taft, appointed, selected basically, by Teddy Roosevelt, had lost Teddy Roosevelt's reformer ways. As Roosevelt 
would say in 1912. The Republican Party is now facing a great crisis. It is to decide whether it will be, as in the days of Lincoln, the party of the plain people, the party of progress, the party of social and industrial justice, or whether it will be the party of privilege and of special interests, the heir to those who were Lincoln's most bitter opponents, the party that represents the great interest within and without Wall Street, which desires through their control over the servants of the people to be kept immune from punishment when they do wrong and to be given privileges to which they are not entitled. 1912, this statement was made. And so he challenged the weak Stan Pat Republican Taft, and that weakness inspired an extraordinary political contest. In 1912, four candidates ran for president. Eugene Debs, the most successful socialist candidate ever to run for president. In 1920, he would run from prison and receive the most votes that any socialist ever received. Taft, who was in his first term, running in the second term. Teddy Roosevelt, who came back from his exile imposed upon himself to run again in a bull moose party because he didn't believe Taft had achieved the objectives he had set for him, and Woodrow Wilson. Now the thing to remember about Roosevelt and Wilson is that both were self-described progressives. They both said they were for the progressive cause. 70% of the American people voted for one of those two people. Woodrow Wilson beat Teddy Roosevelt, but 70% stood up for the idea that democracy had been corrupted and that corruption has to end. Now, the thing we have to remember is that change only ever happens this way. It's easy for us on the left to feel entitled and righteous about how right we are about so many of the issues that now face our government, but what we must learn from that past is how to speak more broadly and to include more, not by compromising on our principles. I'm not someone who believes that there's no real difference between the left and the right. There's a real difference between the left and the right, and I want to defend the values of the left against principled people on the right. But what we need to recognize is even though we have different objectives, we have a common enemy. We have a system that defeats change on the left and change on the right, and we need to build alliances on the right where our principles match. And my view is the left should be doing this now. The left should be doing this by convincing and helping to convince the other side that this system is rigged both against them and against us. Right? So for example, when the Tea Party Patriots launched a movement to fight earmarks, we should have joined them in that movement. Because even though Barack Obama was right that earmarks are a tiny percentage of the budget, it completely missed the point. Earmarks are the basic infrastructure for the system of corruption that Washington has become, and earmarks feed this system as directly and powerfully as anything does. And if the right had achieved truly abolishing the earmarks, our objectives would be one step closer to being achieved. And when the Ohio Tea Party pushed very hard to get the Republicans to support the Office of Congressional Ethics, the only office that actually has the power or the will to show when Congress people have violated the law, we should have been there supporting them too, loudly and strongly, because it was the right thing for them and us. We should be pushing ideas that all can agree on here that get us to a place where more Americans recognize the corruption this democracy has become and how we're gonna fight it. We're not gonna have agreement on every issue. But it is possible to build a coalition across the different grassroots movements that exist and exert themselves now for progress. Progress here meaning to end this corruption as quickly as we can. But I want to end today with a, 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 a part of the story which is extremely meaningful to me and um, I think can be meaningful that for inspiring this movement. Um, and it's a story that starts with some fantastic shoes, Keds, which are made by Stridewright, which is started by Arnold Hyatt, who's a very shy soul. This is the largest picture that exists on the World Wide Web of Arnold Hyatt, because he's very shy. But Arnold is a loyal Democrat. And in 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. 
1997, Bill Clinton invited Arnold Hyatt and 30 other fat cats to a dinner at the Mayflower Hotel, a dinner for these fat cats, to give them a chance <laughs> to tell the president what he should do in the balance of his administration. We don't have any actual photos there uh, from the events. Everyone got up and said their little piece to the president, and Arnold Hyatt was the last. I don't actually know exactly what it looked like, but I kind of envision it something like this. So Arnold stands up <laughs> to address the president, and he says, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I want you to put yourself in Roosevelt's shoes in 1939 when he had reluctantly come to the conclusion that he had to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Because Arnold said, Mr. President, you too have to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, a war against fat cats, people like us people who believe that merely because we have money, we have the right to control how the democracy works, people who believe we're entitled to pick up the phone and get the president on the other side. Now, as you can imagine, in this room filled with fat cats, there was a little bit of silence after Arnold was finished with his speech. The only published account we have of the evening reports that Clinton's response effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group. And I think we have to recognize that 15 years later, it's Arnold Hyatt who was right, that we have to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. And if Lincoln is an inspiration here, we could call it, in the spirit of this group, a great civil war in the sense of civil, as in a war we fight civilly to get other people to understand our ideas and our cause. Test this war is, whether, as Lincoln put it, that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. It is their job to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us. What was that task? It was the task of proving that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Of, by, for people. We have lost that republic. We have a republic of, by, and for the funders. And you have to help change that. Thank you very much.